Over the time through this ministry, there have been many videos made explaining truths that the world system likes to cover up and hide. We have been working diligently to remove the falsehoods from the matrix out of our understanding. In the Understanding Israel series, I have went through topics from a standpoint of presenting the truth so that the truth can have its day. Yah told me to focus on the truth before I start dealing with the lies. And after I made part eight of the Understanding Israel series, I felt an approval of discussing a long overdue topic. As I discuss who the Hebrews are, there is always much confusion because of the huge elephant in the room. Basically, if this information is true, then who are those people that are in the land of Israel right now? If the information I'm giving is true, who are the people that the world says are Jews? This topic is not something that I take lightly because this world does not like the subject being spoken of. Though the history is well documented and plain to see, you won't see any History Channel documentaries explaining what I'm about to say. In the first part of this current hijacker series, we dealt with the Roman Catholic Church. And we had to deal with that topic first because when speaking of the hijackers, you cannot ever skip over the Roman Catholic Church, which is the beginning point of the planting of the tares. But this current topic has always been what I needed to get to. You know, it's clear that we are in the last days. And regardless of your end time doctrine, the overall understanding of what is to come is the man of sin, the lawless one, the beast of revelation, whom the world knows as the Antichrist, we all know of this figure, but we, for the most part, gloss over what he is coming to do. And especially if you've been influenced by the Christian end times doctrine from people like Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins, creators of the Left Behind series, they have told an entertaining story that this Antichrist just comes up out of nowhere in a world that wasn't really living in deception besides that the majority rejected Jesus. All those who accepted Jesus before were raptured and the end times is all about making new Christians. That's what their storyline says. That's what end times Christian doctrine really shows. A part of that story is what the Antichrist does with the Jews. But I'm sorry to say that that work is a story of fiction and the truth is quite different than what they have presented. You know, it's clear that everyone expects an Antichrist, an anti-Messiah. If you understood the world that we live in, you would understand that Satan, the god of this world, has been puppet mastering this world for millennia and has been pushing forth his satanic agenda for his satanic kingdom. When the time comes, the Antichrist will rise. His rise is a long-held goal by Luciferans and those who pledge to spread his light. And so what all of them are doing are preparing the world for his acceptance by spreading the light of Lucifer. The Antichrist is just a part of this, but he will not come until they feel the world is ready and Yah allows it, which clearly, it seems like the world is ready right now though. I believe we're waiting on Yah. Anyways, we expect an Antichrist, but we don't realize that the only reason he will rise up and be claimed King of the Jews and the rest of the world is because he is being raised up in an anti yasharel Everything about this group of people that are inhabitants of this land right now is all about bringing about the conditions for this coming satanic kingdom. This has been a goal for at least a millennia and was only able to come about after the first hijacker we spoke on last week dealt harshly with the true Hebrews so that they could properly stamp out knowledge of their existence while bringing the world into acceptance of the hijackers. You might think all of this sounds crazy right now or a reach, but I don't think you can hold this view as we go through this history. So we're going to discuss the history of the people who the world feels are the actual chosen people. Let's begin. Now let me say this. I love the Semitic people. I do not hate anyone. I simply have a view of history that may differ from what the mainstream teaches. But this is not about hate, but about facts and understanding. I am speaking from a standpoint of history. And as I have done with the Understanding Israel series, I will cite my sources from which I am bringing this history out. And let me be clear that once this information is presented, you'll see that a quick Google search can confirm all of this because the information is not even hidden. It's just not mainstream. So for this video, I will be using Arthur Kostler's book, The 13th Tribe, and Kevin Allen Brooks' book, The Jews of Khazaria. 
I will try to place these books on my website. Let me again be clear. There have been many different books on this subject. Dr. Godby speaks on this topic as well, but these books I'm referencing right now were specifically made for this topic, and therefore they discuss this topic the most in depth. So let's get to it. Fortunately, the answer to the question of who are the people in this land is the beginning answer to where we must start in this understanding. So let's speak on it. These people are Khazars or Khazars. I'm not sure how they pronounce it, but that's the word if you ever want to research it on your own. So in order to understand this subject, we need to discuss the Khazars. Kevin Brooke explains that the Khazars emerged on the world scene as Turkic horsemen who believed in shamanism and lived a nomadic lifestyle. They are predominantly Turkic and probably originated in the steppes of Central Asia or perhaps in the Ural or Caucasus mountains. So the details of their origins are said to be somewhat obscure. Now I do have a reason for this and I believe Edom is a part of that, but I'm not ready to discuss that because I want to deal with facts and not my speculation based off of the little parts of the research I've done. I want to stick to the facts right now. Kostler writes, the origin of the name Khazar has been the subject of much speculation. Most likely the word is derived from the Turkish root Gaz to wander and simply means nomad. And they speculate this because this is what Khazars were. Rook says the Khazars were racially and ethnically mixed. Among them were black haired peoples with dark brown eyes, red haired peoples with green or hazel eyes, and fair haired peoples with blue eyes. Many resembled Europeans or Eastern Europeans. One of the earliest factual references to the Khazars dates from the year 555 AD, when an anonymous author wrote a supplement attached to the Syriac translation of the Greek church history, Zacharias Reiter. In this supplement, Brooks says the Khazars were listed among the nomadic tribes living in tents north of the Caucasus Mountains. So that's really where their history begins when people start documenting them. So let's talk about their history. For over 60 years, the Western Turks ruled the Khazars. In the year 567 AD, hordes of Western Turks arrived in the Volga River region. They assumed control over the Sabirs, Onagers, and the Alans of the North Caucasus. By circa 570, the Khazars were under the jurisdiction of the Western Turkish Empire. The Western Turkish Empire broke apart during the 630s. The tribes of the North Caucasus found themselves in the midst of a major transition. After the disintegration of the Western Turkish Empire, the Khazars were able to reassert their independence in their land. So after the Western Turks, they began to govern themselves. The independent state of Khazaria was established in the 630s, 40s. The whole region between the Volga and the fortress city of Durban came into possession of the Khazars. This area right here. The Khazars soon became the dominant power in southern Russia. The expansion of Khazaria into new territories displaced other ethnic groups. Khazaria was one of the most diverse nations of medieval Europe. It was a multi-ethnic society with a population of Slavic, Turkic, Iranian, Arabic, and Caucasian peoples who professed other faiths, including Islam and Christianity. What I am trying to explain here is that this group of people were not Hebrews. They did not descend from the Hebrews by blood. They were a mixture of different groups, but they were not mixed with, nor were they descendants from Judah or Yasharel. In Kevin Brooks' book, this is a map of Khazaria and neighboring empires in the 9th and 10th century. This area is what we know as the Ukraine today, and that is not a coincidence. But let's keep going. Khazaria was a major center for trade, especially in the 8th and 9th centuries. The Khazars controlled several trade routes that connected Asia and Europe. One of the most important of these was along the Volga. This was a well-known people. Unlike the history I had to go through about the Tsar dynasty, the Khazars and their history is well known and not even hidden. 
That's why when anyone challenges me about who these people in the land are, I can tell they haven't tried to research them at all because they're not hiding this information. It's very plain to see. So these are the people, the Khazars. The next question must be, where am I going with all this? How did they become Jewish, right? It's very simple. They converted. Arthur Kostler explains that at the beginning of the 8th century, the world was polarized between the two superpowers representing Christianity and Islam. Their ideological doctrines were welded to power politics pursued by the classical methods of propaganda, subversion, and military conquest. Basically saying that during the time of the 8th century, the world was ruled by either Christianity or Islam. So, the Khazar Empire represented a third force, which had proved equal to either of them, Christianity or Islam, both as an adversary and an ally. But it could only maintain its independence by accepting neither Christianity nor Islam, for either choice would have automatically subordinated it to the authority of the Roman Emperor or the Caliph of Baghdad. There had been no lack of efforts by either court to convert the Khazars to Christianity or Islam, but all they resulted in was the exchange of diplomatic courtesies, dynastic intermarriages, and shifting military alliances based on mutual self-interest. Relying on its military strength, the Khazar kingdom was determined to preserve its position as the third force, summing that all up, basically saying that in order to keep their independence, they weren't going to accept Christianity or Islam. Kostler quotes J.B. Burry from his book, A History of the Eastern Roman Empire. There could be no question that the ruler was actuated by political motives in adopting Judaism. To embrace Mohammedism would have made him the spiritual dependent of the Caliphs who attempted to press their faith on the Khazars. And in Christianity, lay the danger of his becoming an ecclesiastical vassal of the Roman Empire. Judaism was a reputable religion with sacred books which both Christian and Mohammedan respected. It elevated him above the heathen barbarians and secured him against the interference of caliph or emperor. But he did not adopt, along with circumcision, the intolerance of the Jewish cult. He allowed the mass of his people to abide in their heathendom and worship their idols. They were adopting the faith. They weren't actually taking it in sincerity, a political move very similar to what the Roman Catholic Church did. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. So before I go any further about this conversion, I wanna make something clear. This conversion is not based on someone's opinion. This is not speculation. It is in fact well-documented. There are primary sources that anyone can seek out for themselves in order to understand this clearly. There are Khazar documents such as the Reply of King Joseph, the Schechter Letter, also called the Cambridge Document, and the Kievan Letter. There are reports from Arab and Persian historians and travelers and commentators. There is the Persian treatise Denkart and many other sources. Just look these sources up yourself. It speaks about the conversion of the Khazars. But just note that even without these sources, you have a group of people named Khazars who are actually nomadic Turks, not Hebrews, who reside in this area of Eastern Europe, the exact place where most of the Jews in Israel today came from. This is no coincidence, but we will keep going. Postler writes, Khazaria was a relatively civilized country among the barbarians of the North, yet not committed to either of the militant creeds and so it became a natural haven for the periodic exodus of Jews under Byzantine rule, threatened by forced conversion and other pressures. Persecution in varied forms has started with Justinian I, 527 to 65, and assumed particularly vicious forms under Heraclius in the seventh century, Leo III in the eighth, Basil and Leo IV in the ninth, and Romanus in the 10th. The true Yahudim, were being persecuted in that area as well. As they were continuously being persecuted, they were continuously scattering. This is a part of the prophecy of the scattering. Yah was going to move the true Yahudim and scatter them all around the world. This is a part of that prophecy. They would find no rest, so they kept searching and seeking for some kind of place at refuge. 
I have went over the same history very often. The true Yahudim never really caught a break and they were continuously pressured to convert to Christianity or they were persecuted. This third force of Khazaria became a place of refuge for them. Leo III, who ruled the Byzantine Empire during two decades immediately before the Khazars converted to Judaism, he attempted to end the tolerated status of Jews by ordering all his Jewish subjects to be baptized. History notes that the implementation of the order seemed to be ineffective, but it led to the flight of a considerable number of Yahudim from Byzantium. The only mercy shown by history to the Yahudim who took flight or were driven to it was the existence of Khazaria, both before and after the conversion. In al bakris Book of Kingdoms and Roads, 11th century, I referenced them in part eight of the Understanding Israel series. In his book, he writes, the reason for the conversion to Judaism of the king of the Khazars, who had previously been a pagan, is as follows. He had adopted Christianity. Then he recognized its falsehood and discussed this matter, which greatly worried him, with one of his high officials. The latter said to him, O king, those in possession of sacred scriptures fall into three groups. Summon them and ask them to state their case. Then follow the one who is in possession of the truth. So he sent to the Christians for a bishop. Now there was with the king a Jew, skilled in argument, who engaged him in disputation. He asked the bishop, Who do you say of Moses, the son of Amron, and the Torah which was revealed to him? The bishop replied, Moses is a prophet, and the Torah speaks the truth. Then the Jew said to the king, He has already admitted the truth of my creed. Ask him now what he believes in. So the king asked them, and he replied, I say that Jesus the Messiah is the son of Mary. He is the word, and he has revealed the mysteries in the name of God. Then said the Jew to the king of the Khazars, He preaches a doctrine which I know not, while he accepts my propositions. But the bishop was not strong in producing evidence. Then the king asked for a Muslim, and they sent him a scholarly, clever man who was good at arguments. But the Jew hired someone who poisoned him on the journey and he died. And the Jew succeeded in winning the king for his faith so that he embraced Judaism. That account seems a little biased, but okay, that's his account. The next account we can look to comes from the Khazar correspondence, which is an exchange of letters in Hebrew between Hasdai ibn Shaprut, the Jewish chief minister of the Caliph of Cordoba, and Joseph, king of the Khazars, or rather, between their respective scribes. According to his own account, Hasdai first heard of the existence of an independent Jewish kingdom from some merchant traders from Khorasan and Persia, but he doubted the truth of this story. Later, he questioned the members of the Byzantine diplomatic mission to Cordoba, and they confirmed the merchant's account, contributing a considerable amount of factual detail about the Khazar kingdom, including the name, Joseph, of its present king. Thereupon, Hasdai decided to send couriers with the letter to King Joseph. The letter contains a list of questions about the Khazar state, its people, method of government, armed forces, and so on, including an inquiry to which of the 12 tribes Joseph belonged. This seems to indicate that Hasdai thought that the Jewish Khazars to hail actually from Israel, as the Spanish Yahudim did, and perhaps even to represent one of the lost tribes. King Joseph, of course, not being of Yahudim descent, belonged, of course, to none of the tribes. In his reply to Hasdai, he provides a genealogy of a different kind, but his main concern is to give Hasdai a detailed, if legendary, account of the conversion, which took place two centuries earlier, and the circumstances that led to it. Joseph's narrative starts with the eulogy of his ancestor, King Bulan a great conqueror and a wise man who drove out the sorcerers and idolaters from his land. Subsequently, an angel appeared to King Bulan in his dreams, exhorting him to worship the only true God and promising that in exchange, he will bless and multiply Bulan's offsprings and deliver his enemies into his hands and make his kingdom last to the end of the world. And of course, this story is inspired by Abraham's covenant. It implies that the Khazars were claiming the status of a chosen people, 
who made their own covenant with Yahuwah, even though they were not descended from Abraham's seed. Ulan's renunciation of idolatry in favor of the only true God was only the first step, which still left the choice open between the three monotheistic creeds. At least, this is what the continuation of Joseph's letter seems to imply. In the letter, he went on to say, After the Khazar's invasion of Armenia, King Bulan's fame spread to all countries. The king of Edom, Byzantium, and the king of Ishmaelin, the Muslims, heard the news and sent to him envoys with precious gifts and money, and learned men to convert him to their beliefs. But King Bulan was wise and sent for a Jew with much knowledge and acumen and put all three together to discuss their doctrines. So real quick, what's being said is that King Bulan met with an angel that told him to worship the only true God and he would be made a covenant as a chosen people. And this is very much like the story of Islam, just in a different flavor. And so now King Bulan was trying to figure out which religion actually was the representation of the one true God. This is what they're saying. So we have another brain trust or round table conference, just like Al-Bakri spoke of, with the difference that the Muslim had not been poisoned beforehand. But the pattern of the argument is much the same. After long and futile discussions, the king adjourns the meeting for three days, during which the discussants are left to cool their heels in their respective tents. Then he reverts to a strategy. He convokes the discussants separately. He asks the Christian which of the other two religions is nearer the truth. And the Christian answers, the Jews. He confronts the Muslim with the same question and gets the same reply. And from this, he chose Judaism. Both books, the 13th tribe and Jews of Khazaria go more in depth of this conversion and they explain through those primary sources I referenced. I'm not trying to give an in-depth study on this conversion because it doesn't really matter to me. The fact is that the Khazars converted to Judaism to keep power over their kingdom and not bow to the Roman Catholic Church or the Islamic Caliphate. This is an undisputed fact. Under the reign of King Bulan, during the first half of the 9th century, the Khazars officially converted to Judaism. Bulan became the first Jewish ruler of the Khazars, following almost two centuries of shamanists and Muslim rulers. So let's be clear. When speaking of this people, we are not speaking about people that were prophesied of, but people that hijacked a covenant in the 9th century. And the information is out there easy to find for anyone who desires to know the history for themselves. Brooks writes, The religion of the Jews was voluntarily accepted by the Khazars in the middle of the 9th century. Available evidence indicates that the Khazars practiced standard rabbinical Judaism consisting in part of the following elements. 1. Circumcision 2. Observance of Hanukkah 3. Observance of Passover 4. Observance of the Sabbath 5. Study of the Torah, Talmud, and Mishnah 6. Prayer according to the proper order established by the Kazans 7. Observance of the laws of kosher by refraining from food banned by the Torah 8. Washing rituals and ritual ablutions 9. Simple burials 10 refraining from idol worship, 11, adherence to all the other guidelines of Jewish law, 12, giving newborn children Hebrew names, 13, constructing synagogues, 14, using Hebrew character set for writing, 15, using the Hebrew language, and 16, building a tabernacle in the shape of that built by Moses. And it was from this point, this point in history, that there was a group in this world that were Jews, that were not Jews by blood or by covenant, but by conversion. And this is very different biblically compared to what Bible prophecy actually deals with. You cannot just convert a group of people into Yah's promise and take their covenant. It does not work this way. And everyone needs to deal with that. So there was history of the Khazars after their conversion. And for time's sake, I will not go over the history because it does not serve a purpose. Let's just be clear that while the rest of the scattered Yahudim around the world were suffering from persecutions and forced baptisms and forced conversions, the Khazarian Jews did not meet with that same struggle. They were the third force in the world. Not to say that they did not have contenders against them, they were just not under the curses, which is why we continuously say, if you want to understand who Yasharel is today, 
you have to go to the curses. But keeping on with the history, eventually their Khazarian Empire fell to Russia in the 10th century. But from this point in history, when they are spoken about by those writing history, they are no longer mentioned by Khazars any longer, more than they were referred to as Jews. And they assumed the identity of the chosen ones of the Most High. This point in history, from now, whenever you're hearing about Jews, you're hearing about them. In modern history, they hijack the identity. For instance, in the account of when Russia turns to Christianity, in the Russia Primary Chronicle, also called Chronicle of Nestor or Kiev Chronicle, it gives a detailed account of the early history of the Eastern Slavs to the second decade of the 12th century. It speaks on Prince Vladimir's conversion to Orthodox Christianity. It tells us, before his conversion, he has a series of diplomatic maneuverings and theological discussions with representatives of the four major religions. This is very much like a kind of mirror image to the debates before the Khazar conversion to Judaism. There were four major religions now because of the break between the Roman Catholic Church, which was the Latin Church, and the Greek, which was the Orthodox Church. The Russian Chronicles account of Vladimir's conversion first mentioned a victory he achieved against the Volga Bulgars, followed by a treaty of friendship. The Bulgars declared, may peace prevail between us till stone floats and straw sinks. Vladimir returned to Kiev and the Bulgars sent a Muslim religious mission to convert him. They described to him the joys of paradise where each man will be given 70 fair women. Vladimir listened to them with approval. But when it came to abstinence from pork and wine, he drew the line. Drinking, said he, is the joy of the Russes. We cannot exist without that pleasure. Next came a German delegation of Roman Catholics, adherents of the Latin Rite. They fared no better when they brought up as one of the main requirements of their faith, fasting according to one's strength. Then Vladimir answered, depart hence, our fathers accept no such principle. The third mission consisted of Khazar Jews, and they came off worst, and I want you to listen to this. Vladimir asked them why they no longer rule Jerusalem. They made answer, God was angry at our forefathers and scattered us among the Gentiles on account of our sins. These were Khazars that were saying this. The prince then demanded, how can you hope to teach others while you yourselves are cast out and scattered abroad by the hand of God? Do you expect us to accept that fate also? You see, this is how they answered him. Because they converted to Judaism, they took on the full identity of the Yahudim and were even representatives of this to the rest of the world. And guess what? The rest of the world didn't care. People were converting to either Christianity or Islam. These converts were allowed to be Jews, and therefore they were, while the true Yahudim were not allowed to be Jews, and they were forced into conversions. And this is clear that the identity of the true Yahudim was then hijacked. Now before I get to modern history, let's get a few other things clarified. Throughout history, the Khazars did not just stay in that land. They spread out and dispersed. Kevin Brooks' book goes into great detail of this if you want to read on this further. There is detailed record of how they spread into Hungary, how they spread into Transylvania, which is Romania, Moldova, they went into Lithuania and Belarus, into Poland, Russia, Spain, Ukraine, and of course, Germany. We get the term Ashkenazi because they were in Europe. This should not be news to you if you understand modern history. That's why I try not to argue with people anymore that want to tell me that I'm focused on race or whatever. After all the history I have shown, and then I tell people who these people actually are, if they want to disagree, it's because they rather believe the lie and that's really on them. These Khazarian Jews spread all around Eastern and Western Europe and North Africa. This was their scattering. And while the true Yahudim were being persecuted, they were not a part of it. This was a hijacking of an identity and later on as the hijacking grew in strength and many other agendas came along like the transatlantic slave trade or the conversion of the many of the true Yahudim in Europe over time losing their identity, in our modern times, they hid the history behind race and skin color, which is the subject that most of you deniers can't get past. All you wanna see is skin color. I keep telling everyone in these videos that when you look at skin color, you're moving through your flesh because this was a taught mindset. The overall history of this world was not this way. It was about tribes of people. 
So let's understand more. You want to know why some are called Ashkenazi? According to an article from Harvard Medical School on November 30th of last year, 2022, titled Ancient DNA Provides New Insights into Ashkenazi Jewish History, it says, the largest study to date of ancient DNA from Jewish individuals reveals unexpected genetic subgroups in medieval German Ashkenazi Jews and sheds light on the founder event in which a small population gave rise to most present day Ashkenazi Jews. The findings, spearheaded by geneticists from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Harvard Medical School, were published November 30th in Cell. About half of Jewish people around the world today identify as Ashkenazi, meaning that they descend from Jews who lived in Central or Eastern Europe. The term was initially used to define a distinct cultural group of Jews who settled in the 10th century in the Rhineland and Western Germany. Yeah. Read the rest of the article on your own if you like. I just want to point out that this is the exact history I have just given you. And these people don't even hide it because they use the name Ashkenaz, which is a son of Japheth, showing that they are Europeans that do not descend from Shem. But because people are so moved by skin color and race, they want to gloss over this because that truth is easier for them to accept. Now there is more to this history because as time progressed, there were those who came out of that history and were used by the enemy and given massive wealth and control. They used this control to exert power over the whole world. They were sold out to Lucifer. They have even made it today that it's anti, you know what, to speak of their wealth and control behind the scenes of all industries of the world. These people are Khazars. And all of that history has brought us to the point that we are at right now in history. So let's get back to the question of who are the people in the land right now? Let's first deal with the land starting with Palestine. It's called Palestine from Latin Palestina, which was coined by the ancient Greeks for the area of land occupied by the Philistines. Yes, the original inhabitants of the land were Philistines. They were in control of that land before the Hebrews conquered the land. After the second Jewish revolt, the Hebrews were crushed by the Romans and Emperor Hadrian wiped the province of Judea off the Roman map and renamed it Syria Palestina, which was then broken up into about three part units, Palestina Prima, Palestina Secunda, second, and Palestina Tertia, third. This all existed until the Muslims began their conquest of the Middle East region. In the early to mid seventh century, around 634 AD, Arab Muslim forces had appeared in the area and conquered the land in what was called the Levant. It was the Muslim conquest of the Levant. You should know of this area of the Levant, which contains the areas of Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, and Syria, and the modern state of Israel. That's why Obama used to call the group ISIL instead of ISIS. And one of those groups is ISIL. It was about the Levant. ISIS stands for Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, and ISIL is the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which is more defined and much more than Iraq and Syria. Anyways, after the Muslim conquest of the Levant, by the year 635, Palestine, Jordan, and southern Syria, with the exception of Jerusalem and Caesarea, were in Muslim control. From this point, there were holy wars with the Crusades and the Knights Templar, which was covered in part 66 of the History of Religion series. But the area of Palestine, which included the land of Israel before it was given to its current inhabitants, was occupied territory of Muslims. The land of Israel, specifically the city of Jerusalem, has been highly contested for millennia, but not for reasons that we are seeing today. The conflict that we are seeing today is not a long-held conflict. It was created after World War II. Now, it is important to understand what we are seeing in Israel today is a modern conflict made after a redistribution of land. Now, a lot of that land of Palestine that we just went over, though it was occupied predominantly by Muslims, it was at some point owned by the Rothschilds family. The Rothschilds brought much of the land in Palestine, now called Israel, from the Arabs and Turks. The family was and are huge supporters of the Zionist movement. It's 67 words long, it's 100 years old, and it changed the course of history for the Middle East and the Jewish people. The Balfour Declaration, the expression of the British government's support for a Jewish home in Palestine, 
was sent by British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour to the second Lord Rothschild. I'm here in Buckinghamshire at Waddesdon Manor to speak with the fourth Lord Rothschild about the Balfour Declaration, what it means for Britain, for the Jewish people and the Rothschild family. The Foreign Office, November the 2nd, 1917. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. Possibly the most famous letter in modern Jewish history, and it begins with three words. Dear Lord Rothschild, why was it that this letter was sent by the Foreign Secretary to your great uncle Walter? It's an interesting question because he was really interested in ornithology, <laughs> although he became interested in Zionism. I think the reason was this, that it was primarily a movement from Eastern Europe, but they didn't clarify who was in charge of that movement and in addition it was after all in Great Britain so they felt that the Rothschild family um, should be the one to whom it was addressed and Walter was Lord Rothschild and he was uh, a Zionist and um, those really are the background reasons. So Walter received the Balfour Declaration and, and I have a copy here and I wonder if I could possibly ask you to read it for us. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to put on my spectacles to make sure I read it accurately. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment of Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours, Arthur Balfour. For your own research, these are terms you should research on your own. Zionism. Khazars, Ashkenazi. This is who Yahusha is speaking about in Revelation 2.9 and 3.9. So when talking about all this, people love always asking, so what about this event with Hitler? I won't even say the name of it. You should know. You have to understand the elite's method of order out of chaos and understand what they were able to do after this event. And then why this happened will make much more sense. I am not a denier of this event at all. I just know it happened for specific reasons that we are beginning to see the conclusion of soon, when they rebuild the temple and the Antichrist is claimed king. Anyways, after Hitler, it was decided that the Ashkenazi Jews that were persecuted in Eastern Europe needed their own homeland. Please note, I want you to understand that the slaves that were sent to a foreign land to do forced labor for 400 years that were still being oppressed never received any consideration like this at all. Just note that. And people, they get bothered when we even bring up slavery today. They're like, it's time to get over it. But after this event that happened, the world came together and justified a massive change. And the worst part, the worst part of this all really, is that people actually believe that Yahuwah did this and this is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And I'm making this video to clearly show that it was not. But again, using this strategy of order out of chaos, there was not many that could deny those who were now believed to be true Jews, so they could not deny them the right to their homeland. The Rothschild family donated the land they owned of what was known as Palestine at the time to the United Nations. The United Nations then gave this land to these converted Khazarian Jews so that they would have a homeland and would never have to face the kind of oppression and slaughter they were submitted to during the Holocaust, even though it was never their homeland. And thus, the state of Israel was created. And so when they came over there and took over that land, they had wars against the inhabitants and it was extremely violent. And this is why there is still conflict in that land today, because these people came in and took land that they do not have a claim to. This is why we see 
Gamal Abdel Nasser. He was the second president in Egypt. In 1956, Abdel went on the television and radio in the 50s and stated to the Ashkenazi, you have left black and returned white. You are imposters and shall never see peace. This is the true history of the world. What you have been given is the history of the second major hijacker in this Christian religion. And it goes deeper than just Christianity. But today they use the Christians to support this agenda because the majority of Christians are just followers without discernment. And they feel that they are obligated to follow this agenda because they want to support Israel. But the true wickedness of their hearts are shown because while they support all of this, they persecute and hate the true Yahudim. And they don't even want to understand their plight, which is more biblically tied to the God that they say that they are serving. It's hypocrisy at its finest, and people will be judged for it. And this truth is being given to you, not for hate or anything other than for you to come into knowledge of the truth, and then you turn to the truth and live through it. The truth sets us free. I have presented this information because we are truly at crossroads, and depending on what you follow will determine your future and your relationship with Yah, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't so black and white, but it clearly is. One path is the truth, and Yah will cover you. The other is a lie, and it will lead you into the arms of Satan if it hasn't done this already. I have made a video that speaks about the plot twist that most people are not ready for in the end times. This lie is a big part of it. This whole agenda has been used in order for Satan to take control of Yah's holy city or build the temple originally dedicated for Yahuwah, but Satan wants it dedicated to himself, which is why he will use all three religions that are tied to him. All the rulers of these three world religions are followers of the enemy of Yah, the created being in rebellion. He wants to use this people and bloodline to put his son as king who will be the lawless one. And the thing is that Everyone sees this and they know it. They know that the Jews are trying to rebuild the temple. They know that they just got a, a red heifer in. They know that, that they say that they're ready for the Messiah to come. Wow, these look like the finest red heifers from around the world. But what if I tell you that the Jewish dream to rebuild the temple is not over? There are things that are happening currently in Israel and around the world that clear out the way for the new Jewish temple. If you would ask the Jewish people if they would like the temple to be rebuilt, the vast majority of them would say yes. Out of the majority of Jews that would like to see the temple be rebuilt, there are certain groups that are very active in doing everything that is needed for it to be rebuilt. So some believe that when the perfect candidate will be found, the building of the temple will begin. You can see them peeking out, they look beautiful, unbelievable, perfect, they just look perfect. Um, right now to build the, the third temple. There are actually quite a few and it just um, shows that God is giving the Jewish people kind of signs or an expectation that it's time for the soon coming Messiah. But um, there is a group specifically that has uh, reestablished the Levitical priesthood. They just started a school uh, a few months ago and they have a registry for those who are from the Levitical line um, that they could come and be trained and be ready to do the service in the temple. Um, they've also started a red heifer farm. Um, the Temple Institute did with an Israeli farmer and that was again with ritual purity that they need to have a, a a uh, red heifer that meets uh, Jewish law and has been supervised and doesn't have any white hairs. It's completely red heifer to be able to be burned, mixed with white er, running water, and then um, used to make everybody ritually pure to be able to go into the temple. I mean, right now, if Jewish people just going on the Temple Mount can create a riot sometimes. So can you envision a scenario where, where they would allow the temple to be built? Um, No. 
Um, a lot of the um, scholars that I've spoken to uh, talk about how the building of this next temple is really going to bring peace to Israel and to bring safety from all her, her enemies. And so in that way I can see that um, any maybe leader that would be raised up or somebody that would be able to bring the nations together, especially those who might align with Israel, that there might be some agreement that, that, that the temple could exist there and this person could be set up in the temple. They know all of this. Everyone knows this in Christianity. But because they believe these people are genuine and holders of the covenant, that at some point, Yah will intercede. But this will not happen because those people are not in covenant with Yahuwah and everything that goes forth with them will be about leading into the satanic part of prophecy. And because people love the lie instead of the truth, they follow that path. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Adun will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, Elohim will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who do not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7-12. through 12. I have dedicated this channel to telling the unedited truth, and you must understand it's your choice whether you want to believe it or not. It does not change the truth, nor does it change what will happen in this world. It just matters what side of it you are on. In these last days, it's imperative to break away from falsehoods and lies, and I know Yah is doing something today allowing us to all understand this. I'm not special. He's just equipping me to spread truth biblically and academically. So if you still have a problem with the truth, it's because you love the lie and you will be condemned for it. That's on you. But I know one thing. I know who I serve and he wins. He has promises for us, those who obey and love him. So that is what I will do. He said, listen to me, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Yasharel, who have been upheld by me from birth who have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I am he, and even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. Isaiah chapter 46 verses three and four. He is my source and he is my deliverer. I am living a life in service to him to do my part in preparing his kingdom, which is about helping prepare you. So after this information, if you still don't get it and you want to argue, then I suggest you find another channel to do this with. My focus is on Yah and those who love him. You all that believe the lies, I'll pray for you. But to all of Yasharel, natural and wild branches, let us live in the truth. Let us prepare our hearts. Let us keep Yah's commandments because we love him. Let us prepare ourselves for our coming true king while we also prepare for tribulation and a retreat from this world. Yah will sustain us. So if you don't truly believe that, you better start and grow your faith. Get in the word and seek out our Father in heaven like your life depends on it. Because it does. He is our source and our hope. Yahusha, our Savior, is waiting for us. Let us make ourselves ready. This is our time to be redeemed. No longer live in the lies. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Okay. Thanks again for watching. If this has blessed you, please make sure to like it and share it with others. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to subscribe to this channel. Yah willing, I upload every Friday. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel on Facebook and Instagram, as well as on my website, truthunedited.com. As always, I'd like to thank all who donate and contribute to this ministry. Your donations are truly a blessing to this ministry, and they help very much. Thank you for your love and support and letting our Father use you. You are truly a blessing, and I really appreciate your support. Be blessed. Okay, thanks again, everyone, for watching. I love you all.